Tonight I want to speak on the fourth jhana. I hope uh, by now you might have made some progress in uh, at least trying to attain jhana if you have not attained yet. But even if you have not attained, you don't worry about it. You will one day when you know the way how, when you have time and uh, finding a suitable place, quiet place, away from activities uh, on your holidays, vacations, like today. Today is a holiday, July 4th. And on a day like this, if people decide to spend time in, try, in practicing jhana, this uh, experience, this knowledge you have gained would uh, help you. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, one enters and dwells in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and has purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. This is the formula of the fourth jhana. You can see there are several things in this formula, which uh, you won't find in the previous jhana formulas. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, when you hear with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, you might wonder <laughs> what sort of jhana it is, if there is no even pleasure. Uh, we need some pleasure, <laughs> but the formula says with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and uh, disappearance, or previously disappearance, so joy and grief. We can deal with grief, but how can we get rid of our joy? <laughs> and this is very uh, special uh, formula, because uh, in this formula you see certain things which you, you did not uh, come across in the other uh, formula, the other three. With the abandoning of uh, pleasure and pain, when do we abandon pain? You know, abandoning uh, something uh, sounds like uh, we uh, deliberately throw it away. But here we don't abandon like that. It so happened when we are in that jhana, it so happened that pain disappears. What is that jhana? Where we abandon pain? Here we uh, talk about the attainment of the first jhana. When we attain the first jhana, physical pain disappears. Pain here refers particularly to physical pain. If you still have physical pain, you are not in the, even in the first jhana. When you attain the first jhana, your physical pain should disappear. Suppose you are in the in meditative state, and your pain disappears for a short period of time, and uh, everything else happens during that period, perhaps you could be in jhanic experience. But if you have pain, uh, physical pain, uh, you, have, you are not in the, even in the first jhana. 
why physical and how physical pain disappears when we are in the first jhana. Because there is a, a joy, happiness and concentration. When these three factors function together, we, our pain disappears. Pain may appear uh, even, even in the closest proximity of jhana, in the neighbourhood jhana, in what is called excess concentration. And that is why excess concentration is not something uh, that has a full jhanic power. Because in excess you will you still have pain, even in the first jhana. Uh, only when we are in the absorption concentration in the full first jhanic level, our physical pain disappears because of the, the fact that all these jhanic factors, initial application or thought, sustained application or thought, joy, happiness and concentration, operates in unison as one unit, one uh, sort of package. And it is such a wonderful experience that your mind is fully lodged in that experience. And you won't think of pain, physical pain at all. There may be reasons for pain to arise, but you don't even feel that because your mind is so absorbed in this joy happiness and concentration. I also want to mention sometimes people think when you are in the first jhana, some people say uh, you don't hear anything, you don't feel anything, you don't uh, uh, have any thought, you are completely lost. If that happens in if that happens only in the first jhana itself, then uh, what can we gain from the higher jhanas? If everything happens in the first jhana, then we don't have to go to higher jhanas. In the first jhana, our hearing still is there and feeling still is there, and uh, thoughts are still there, like initial application thought and so forth, and yet joy, happiness and concentration are very powerful, uh, not extremely powerful but relatively powerful, powerful enough to for uh, not to feel physical pain. And that is why we have, the, we have this, that, that's why the formula says, uh, with the abandoning of pain. And then, uh, grief, the second factor we abandon, grief is more mental. In Pali it's called Domanasa. Uh, there are uh, four types of feelings mentioned here. Sukha, Dukkha, Domanasa and Somanasa. Sukha and Dukkha are physical, Somanasa and Domanasa are mental. Sometimes people might wonder how can that there be any uh, physical feeling without mental involvement. 
mental involvement certainly must be there, otherwise you don't feel any pain, any, any feeling whether it is uh, uh, physical, uh, what you call uh, happiness or joy. Now, Pali words are Dukkha, Sukha, Somanasa, Domanasa. Dukkha is physical pain, Sukha is physical pain, Domanasa is, I mean, Sukha is physical pleasure, physical happiness, and Domanasa is mental pain, Somanasa is mental happiness or pleasure. Now, the first of these four, and more gross, is dukkha, physical pain. And that would be abandoned at the attainment of the first jhana. Then, the next level, we have uh, dhormanasa, mental displeasure or grief, disappointment which would be abandoned at the attainment of the second jhana. How we abandon uh, grief or disappointment when we attain the second jhana? Because in the second jhana, the joy factor is uh, stronger than the first jhana. Because uh, uh, initial application of thought, sustained application of thought are abandoned. And therefore, joy factor becomes stronger. You know, when certain mental factors are present, certain other mental factors are, although they are there, they are not that prominent. Joy is in the first jhana itself, but joy is not as strong as in the second jhana because of the presence of uh, initial application and sustained application of thought. Uh, they overshadow joy in the first jhana. But when, when the initial application and sustained application is gone, that uh, influence is gone and therefore joy becomes stronger and along with the strong joy, grief disappears. Uh, it's called dhormanasa, disappointment or grief. Sometimes you can see yourself, you can experience, you can know. People, people often ask us, how do I know in which jhana I am? This is how you know. When you are in the second jhana, your joy, happiness and concentration is stronger than the first one. You don't have a scruple of grief, disappointment, anger. Uh, there can be reasons for people to have grief. Uh, very, in a subtle way, but that grief is no longer there in you in the second jhana. Joy, happiness and concentration are very strong. When you attain the third jhana, joy factor will disappear. What is called piti will disappear. Now, why should we give up pity, joy? Because it is so wonderful, uh, we, we really are looking forward to gaining some joy. Well, before we uh, master the third jhana, joy factor is very important. I mean, before we master the second jhana, joy factor is very important. But when we keep mastering the second jhana, we begin to see the weakness of joy factor. As I said, uh, uh, joy factor 
inherently uh, weak and uh, inherently weak because uh, it always has to fight with uh, disappointment, grief, and therefore it 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 wears out, uh, and so we feel it uh, is uh, getting uh, weaker, and therefore. When we attain this third jhana, that weak factor will be abandoned. Then when we abandon that, there will not be any longer the grief, what you call uh, joy, joy factor is no longer there. Although joy factor is important at the beginning, when we go higher and higher and higher, even the joy becomes uh, more gross. as the mind becomes more refined, the joy becomes gross. When we ordinarily, you know, joy is something wonderful, but as the mind becomes more and more refined, more and more um, peaceful, more and more subtle, uh, joy is, uh, is very gross. So, when we attain the third jhana, uh, we abandon that. We abandon, when we say we abandon that, we uh, make it disappear. We make it disappear by not paying attention to it. As we keep repeating again and again, we find this weak factor and we don't pay attention to that. You may wonder how are we going to dis discard them, dis make them disappear. Uh, we, we cannot take it, you know, you know, from our mind and throw it away. Uh, just like a physical object, in order not to make it uh, present there, what we have to do is not to pay attention. As I mentioned many times in our discourses uh, in the past, uh, when we pay attention to something, that thing exists. That is why the Buddha said, Manasikara Sambhava Sabbe Dhamma. Manasikara Sambhava Sabbe Dhamma. Manasikara means attention. Attention is one of the factors of mindfulness. And that is always present in the jhanic practice, in jhana meditation as well. So, we use this Manasikara, we use this attention to keep something. For instance, in order to maintain jhanic level, once you attain the jhana, you got to maintain that attainment with manasikara, with attention. If you do not pay attention, it slowly fades away. It becomes sort of a atrophy, disuse, and become. It would be it would feel that uh, it is neglected. So when it is neglected, it would say, well, why should I bother him? Let me disappear. So it disappears from the mind. Because you do not pay attention to it. And this is very important to remember how we eliminate these factors by not paying attention. And this is also very important to remember whether we practice vipassana meditation or tranquility meditation, attention is absolutely necessary in order either to attain it or to abandon something. If you want to abandon it, don't pay attention. Let it, let it uh, go, let it obliviate. If you want to nourish it, support it, maintain it, uphold it, pay attention to it. And this attention can also be two types. If we pay unmindful attention, it turns out to be negative. If we pay mindful attention, it turns out to be positive. Therefore, this, these two are called Yoniso Manasikara, Ayoniso Manasikara. Ayoniso Manasikara means unmindful reflection, unmindful attention. So, mindfulness is always there for us to use, whether we practice vipassana or tranquility meditation. 
even if we, when we practice with tranquility meditation, we have to have yonisho manasikara, mindful attention. If we practice, if at, at any moment, if we use unmindful attention, then instead of uh, abandoning, we can strengthen it. And that is why Buddha said uh, everywhere, when we pay uh, unmindful attention to unwholesome thing, we nourish the root. We uh, make it flourish. When we pay mindful attention to unwholesome things, then we suffocate it. It's starved to death. Don't feed it. When we pay my unmindful mindful attention to unwholesome thing, we don't feed it. Similarly, if we pay unmindful attention to wholesome thing, then wholesome thing will be suffocated, starved to death. If we pay mindful attention to wholesome thing, then wholesome thing will be nourished and uh, flourished. Now, uh, the, we, we can, e even in jhana, uh, we uh, play with this attention. Uh, if we pay mindful attention, uh, we can let go of this joy. If we pay unmindful attention, we cling to joy. And we stay. That is what happens to meditators. That is why, that is one of the reasons why uh, the people say tranquility meditation is dangerous. Because the joy, happiness in tranquility meditation is so powerful. And to make it even stronger, concentration is there. And these three are so tempting, so enticing. And to, to make it even worse, somebody can remain unmindful, pay unmindful attention to them. And therefore, one would not make the best use of the jhana. But it is very unlikely that somebody who practices wholesome concentration to pay unmindful attention to any of these things. Very unlikely. It normally doesn't happen. But it is still possible. And therefore, when one attains the third jhana, mindfulness becomes strong, clear comprehension becomes strong, and use that mindful attention to let go of this most pleasant experience called joy. There we need mindful attention to let go of joy. Because joy is so um, tempting. And if we are not mindful, we can get carried away. So, now, now we have abandoned three of those four factors. One is pain from the, we abandon when we attain the first jhana. Then we have abandoned grief when we attain the second jhana. Then we abandon joy when we attain the third jhana. And what is left? happiness. When we attain the fourth jhana, we abandon happiness. In the fourth jhana, there is another factor which is far superior to happiness. Happiness in the fourth jhana, or the third jhana and so forth, is uh, it's an experience, it's a, it's a feeling. Joy is a, is a part of uh, Vedana, Vedana Khanda, the, one of the aggregates, uh, but happiness is a feeling. Now when we attain the fourth jhana, there is neither pain nor pleasure, uh, no pleasure, feeling. Neither pain nor pleasure, feeling. 
what is neither pain nor pleasure? Another word for it is equanimity. When the equanimity as a feeling arises, this feeling, equanimous feeling, is um, of course average person, ordinary person, person who does not attain it, has not attained it, may not think very highly of neither pleasant nor unpleasant feeling. It is just another word, mean, means nothing. But when you attain the fourth jhana, neither pleasant nor painful feeling is extremely peaceful feeling. Feeling that uh, uh, arise through the maturity of our spiritual growth. When our emotional side becomes very mature, this impartial feeling rises. Unless we are emotionally grow or mature, the neither pleasant nor painful feeling uh, will not make, will not arise. We have to grow spiritually. To remain, uh, on the one hand there is emotion, on the positive emotion, a negative emotion. We had to juggle these two properly. When you juggle this, if the mind is not mature spiritually, has not grown emotionally, we may tilt to this side or to that side. We lose the balance. So when we come to the fourth jhana, there are special, special mental states to make emotion steady, very uh, mature. If I were to give you a very crude example, like a very understanding, mature parent looking at a child's uh, foolish uh, uh, emotional reaction. Childish uh, uh, emotional when a child, uh, uh, you know, very in a childish way, react emotionally. Very understanding, mature parents will talk to the child and pacify the child, make the child understand that is unnecessary emotional reaction. To do that parents have to have a very balanced emotional state. Otherwise they also will get carried away with the child's childish emotional behaviour. Similarly, when the meditator reaches the fourth jhana, he has gone through all sort of things up to that level, emotionally, spiritually. And therefore, mind is very, very much calm and peaceful and can feel the situation, emotions, in a very balanced state. And therefore, although it is called uh, equanimity, this is equanimity of feeling. You know, some uh, commentaries like uh, Visuddhi Magga, as probably you might all have read, uh, ten kinds of equanimity are mentioned, ten of them. But two of them are present in the fourth jhana. This is one. Now, this neither pleasant nor unpleasant feeling was not present in any of the previous jhanas. Because in the third jhana there was happiness, second jhana there was joy, and the first jhana joy, happiness all were there. And therefore there cannot have 
these two, th this uh, uh, neither pleasant nor unpleasant feeling or this kind of emo uh, equanimity. Only in the fourth jhana, this kind of a, a feeling equanimity arises, in the, only in the fourth jhana. Now, we mentioned four. Now, uh, in the previous jhanas, we simply eliminate. We eliminate, in the first jhana, we eliminate only hindrances and have five jhana factors. When you go to the second jhana, we eliminated initial application of thought, sustained application of thought, no replacement. We just eliminated it. When you come to the third jhana, we eliminated joy, no replacement, just eliminated, we leave the gap. When you come to the fourth jhana, we replace happiness, rather than leaving a gap. We eliminate the happiness, we eliminate happiness and replace it by neither pleasant nor unpleasant feeling. So, in addition, there are some other things in the fourth jhana. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, one enters and dwells in the fourth jhana which has neither pain nor pleasure and has purity of mindfulness. Ah, this is very, very important to remember. Not just mindfulness. In the second jhana, in the third jhana, we had mindfulness and clear comprehension. In the first and second, it is not even mentioned. Mindfulness was there in the first jhana. It was not mentioned there. Why? Because it is just like the moon in the day, bright daylight. When the sun is so strongly shining, the moon doesn't shine at all. Although the moons, uh, you know, may some days, uh, just after full moon day, uh, even daytime there will be moon. Uh, is it after full moon day? Or close to new moon day? Any, anyway, I don't remember this. Uh, faces of the moon. Anyway, uh, sometimes you can see half moon or quarter moon or crescent moon uh, occasionally in the very clear sky. But it doesn't shine at all because the sun is very bright. Similarly, when initial application, sustained application, joy, happiness and concentration are working in full force, Mindfulness doesn't shine. Mindfulness is there, it doesn't show up in the first jhana. We go to the second, joy, happiness and concentration are in the full force, in their prime youth, so to say, strong, powerful, and mindfulness is not shining. When they eliminate, when the joy eliminated, then mindfulness begins to shine in the third jhana. And even clear comprehension shines in the third jhana. But nothing special in it. It doesn't say anything, any, any characteristic, any, any special quality of mindfulness in the third jhana. It is just there. And that helps the meditator to remain mindful in the jhana and out of jhana. But when it comes to the fourth jhana, all these are eliminated, joy, grief, pleasure, and pain and even happiness, which um, overshadow mindfulness, they all are gone and therefore mindfulness not only is there, but even it is pure. Now, 
please remember these, these characteristics of all these jhanic stages, especially third and fourth. Uh, and remember, the mindfulness and uh, mindfulness is a vipassana meditation. And as I mentioned earlier, all these days, we are talking about jhana meditation, concentration meditation. Within concentration meditation, there is mindfulness. And when we come to the fourth jhana, this mindfulness even becomes pure. Upekka sati pari suddhi in Pali. This mindfulness becomes pure. How can it become pure? Because of the presence of equanimity. Now, equanimity became powerful in the fourth jhana, although it was equanimity was in other jhanas, jhanas as well, but in those jhanas, equanimity was not strong enough to purify, polish mindfulness. You know, to polish mindfulness, there has to be something even more powerful than mindfulness itself. Isn't it? We practice mindfulness always, mindfulness, 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 mindfulness. There is no way to polish the rough edges of mindfulness. There's no way. When we come to the fourth jhana, mindfulness becomes very sharp and clear, pure. Why? Because of equanimity. Equanimity itself has to be powerful to polish mindfulness. How it happens? You know, all the emotional factors have been dealt with. All emotional factors, joy, grief, pleasure, happiness, all are dealt with. Only when, when they are present, equanimity is very much like the uh, moon in the daylight. But when these emotional factors are all gone, then equanimity has its chance. It becomes very powerful, very strong. And that polishes mindfulness and clean up mindfulness. So, where do we get mindfulness to be cleaned up? It has to be in the practice of jhana meditation. How do we get it into jhanic meditation? How do we get mindfulness into jhanic meditation? Because we have already practiced it earlier. Tranquility meditator or jhanic meditator is not expected to start everything from the vacuum, from out of blue, from empty space. Right mindfulness, right concentration or samma samadhi has to be started from the basis or foundation of mindfulness in order to have a right concentration, a skillful concentration, as we mentioned. A skillful concentration can be practiced on the basis of mindfulness. The seven factor, seven step of the Noble Eightfold Path, we practiced it. And there we could not get it purified, cleansed, polished, and while it re is still remaining unpolished, crude, we move on to jhana practice, tranquility meditation, eight steps of the Noble Eightfold Path, and then practice it. When we practice, that previous experience of mindfulness is not lost. The previous experience of mindfulness is not lost. It is still there. So it keeps coming with the jhana, and what the jhana does, every time we attain the jhana, this mindfulness also gets little share of it, 
of the of the power of uh, concentration, it gets its little share. And it, when we go higher and higher and higher, it all of a sudden pop up, shines, and that then even get purified because of the cousin, so so to say, of mindfulness is equanimity. We cannot practice mindfulness without without equanimity. You see, when we practice mindfulness, we always have to remain equanimous because mindful meditator also is juggling all all the factors. And this, it can juggle all the factors only if there is equanimity. In the seven factors of enlightenment or thirty-seven factors of enlightenment, whatever, equanimity is always in the as a as as a justice, looking both sides to balance. And that equanimity uh, is in mindfulness practice and in jhana practice. And therefore, when we come to the fourth jhana, this all powerful, all pervasive, emotion free, unbiased mental state called equanimity becomes strong. Here equanimity is not a feeling. Equanimity here is not a feeling. It is just a balanced state of mind. So in the fourth jhana there are two equanimities. One equanimity replaces happiness and there it is called neither pain nor pleasure. And the other equanimity which is not emotional, emotion, not a feeling, but balances everything, purifies mindfulness, which we have already practiced. Then what happens? Now, when one attains the fourth jhana, that person is a, in a very good situation to use concentration because concentration also is very properly, carefully guided only in one direction without uh, losing its uh, strength. Uh, because uh, attention is there. Attention is there, mindfulness is there, equanimity is there. With these qualities, concentration becomes really powerful. If you gain concentration, you know, all of a sudden one may sit down and have a little concentration. That is not powerful enough because it doesn't have other qualities. When we read, we have concentration. When we have, when we talk, we have to have a certain amount of concentration. <coughs> when we write, we have to have concentration. When we drive, we have to have certain kind of concentration. There are concentration is always there, but none of these situations, a concentration in any any of these situations, is as strong as power and powerful as the fourth jhani concentration. Because the fourth jhani concentration is a very high quality concentration. It got its strength from mindfulness, attention, and equanimity. And therefore, for the one who attained the fourth jhana has two options. Two options. Either directly practice vipassana and attain first stage of sainthood, second stage of sainthood, third stage of sainthood, or fourth stage of sainthood. No supernatural powers. His 
deliberately, he simply uses this concentration to gain supernatural, what you call supramundane attainment. But since he is gone that far, some meditators after attaining the fourth jhana might think of going further in developing supernatural powers. If he does so, that individual will have special additional embellishment, additional qualification. Otherwise, all that all one needs is attaining the four jhana. Four jhanas with four supramanian attainments. They say, I have attained first jhana, therefore I should have stream entry. Not at all. Jhana attainment is completely mundane attainment. We have to use this mundane attainment for supramundane attainment. If we do not pay attention to supramundane, if we do not use them for attaining supramundane states, automatically we don't attain supramundane state. No way. We have to make a special effort and we are in the best position, best situation to practice supramundane attainments, to attain supramundane attainment. Now, um, other than that, jhanas, uh, after fourth jhana, According to um, Abhidhamma explanation, there is one more jhana, fifth jhana, all material jhana. We call fine material jhana. By the way, why do we want to call this fine material jhana? And the other immaterial jhanas. I don't want to talk about immaterial jhanas now. Uh, I still want to focus on uh, fine material jhanas and uh, before I go to the fifth jhana, why do we want to call this attainment fine material jhanas? Because we use fine material objects to cultivate these jhanas. And therefore, based on the object we use for cultivating these jhanas, these jhanas are called fine material jhanas. Immaterial jhanas, they are called immaterial jhanas because the subject we use to cultivate immaterial jhanas are immaterial subject. Therefore, all depend on, this, on the subject or object we use to cultivate jhana. If we use mundane material object, material object, we attain material jhana. If we use immaterial object, we attain immaterial jhanas. Now, what is the fifth jhana? According to Abhidhamma, uh, uh, Abhidhamma method is a very uh, fine uh, analytical method. They go, Abhidhamma teaching goes very systematically. Everything is defined and analyzed. According to that method, we have five jhanas, and they say uh, we need five jhanas according to our own intellectual capacity. Some people are more intellectual than others, and they need, they can attain all in four jhanas. It is uh, um, like um, climbing a mountain, assuming that there are five resting places. 
when you climb a mountain. Somebody who is a wonderful mountaineer, as uh, he's athletic, robust, strong, healthy, young, and that fellow, that fellow doesn't have to rest on each resting places, each resting place, so he can skip one. He will, uh, he will rest on the first one and he will skip the second and rest on the third and fourth and fifth. So he will have only four resting places, skipping the second. The other fellow, not very strong, feeble, not experienced the mountaineer, um, not very robust, young, not young, and that fellow needs to rest on each resting place, five resting places. Similarly, somebody who is very intellectual can skip, can eliminate initial application of thought, sustain application of thought, when one attains the second jhana. Somebody who is not that intellectual may eliminate only initial application of thought when he attains the second jhana. When he attains the third jhana, he will eliminate the sustained application of thought. When he attains the, uh, the fourth jhana, he will eliminate joy. When he attains the fifth jhana, he eliminates happiness. So for each jhanic factor, he needs a jhana to eliminate. That is how one that's how one attains five jhanas, another attains four jhanas. All depends on one's own skill, ability. But the formulas all formula also uh, are different. Uh, we say one who enters the second jhana uh, will have uh, uh, joy, happiness, concentration, uh, born from concentration. Joy, happiness, uh, joy and happiness is born from concentration, according to four jhana method. But according to five jhana method, uh, joy, happiness arises again from uh, what you call uh, being aloof from sensual pleasures. This kind of change is there in the formula. Otherwise, attainment is the same, experience is the same, the goal is the same. Now, friends, with that I must stop without going into immaterial jhana. You have enough with material jhana. <laughs> now, maybe tomorrow, I start with immaterial jhana, and day after tomorrow, I will conclude how we can use the jhanas to attain supramundane attainments. There are, when we come to supramundane attainment, there are all kind of uh, nitty gritty details to put together, and I try to, you know, uh, pull all these loose ends and uh, tie it together on the last. Talk.